And welcome to the Red Leaf Retrocast bonus content Patreon. This is a free episode and the first episode. I am JD, the founder and creator of Red Leaf Retrocast. I'm joined by Kay, the host of the Big Egg Joshi podcast. What's up? How you doing? Good. We got. Uh, we've been planning this in the works for uh, quite a while now, and we finally gained uh, all of the brainstorming that we wanted to do. So we're just going to begin this free episode here to uh, inform everyone our goals of the Patreon. Uh, what's the content you can be looking for, where you can find it, etc., etc. So let's not waste any time. The I spoke about uh, a couple things on various episodes from the Red Leaf Retrocast saying the modern gaming is going to be changing due to uh, host other host obligations and just the new generation of video games has come out and with uh, feedback from the listeners uh, we will be switching to concentrated single video game reviews uh, that will be in the there will be two tiers the $1.50 tier <laughs> taxes and whatnot. damn you Patreon <laughs> and the $5 tier the $1.50 tier again will have those video game single reviews and it won't just be the current gen uh, video games it will also be kind of any video game that myself or perhaps another host is playing uh, that just wants to go over the game and uh, give it a full in-depth review. So that's the goal for that in particular. Uh, and a full disclosure, the episodes that have been free this entire time over the course of the four years of the podcast will remain free. So the ever-so-long wrestling episodes uh, covering the All Japan Women Classics, WCW Nitro uh, 98 Post, and um, just the New Japan through the 90s currently, uh, that will stay free, as well as any uh, current ongoing wrestling that we're covering. In the $1.50 tier, we'll be doing things like this. <clears throat> the historical Joshi wrestling episodes. And this was uh, something you and I, K, uh, really discussed and want to get out uh, from a major historical perspective and uh, archive purposes. Right, it's a time frame that's not really talked about or has a lot of coverage on it, and we were able to luckily stumble upon somebody uh, that was able to have a vast library of this stuff, giving us the ability to at least start covering it. Yes, and uh, it will range from full shows of the... Uh, we're starting in the 2010s, and we'll uh, go into further detail on that when we start discussing the episode. Uh, we'll be doing it ranging from full shows to recommended matches, important matches of the generation, uh, kind of leading up to about where the podcast, Red Leaf Retro, has started uh, reviewing more full-time uh, the Joshi scene. So essentially around 2018 is uh, where we're looking for. So 2010 to 2018. Uh, that's the $1.50 tier. And it's also important to notice, uh, to, to notify you, the listeners, that if the $1.50 tier, uh, you can't afford it or whatever, and because of the historical purposes that we want this these episodes to be, they will be going up on a two-week delay on Kay's podcast, the Big Egg Joshi podcast, for free. Uh, oh. Yes, and I will have them labeled as such to make them sort of uh, differentiated from my normal episodes that I do. Yeah, and for those that aren't familiar with uh, Kay, uh, he is a member of the uh, Redley Fletcher has Russell Cast Edition, um, a huge Joshi fan, <laughs> as I speak for him, and <laughs> right, and he does a lot of historical uh, J Joshi work on his Big Egg Joshi podcast. You can find that podcast. Uh, Wherever podcasts are found, basically. Spotify, you name it. Now, the $5 tier over on Patreon. This is Patreon Red Leaf Retrocast. Very easy to find. There will be a $5 tier, and that will include all the bonus content that perhaps uh, are personal projects for us. Uh, I took a lot of the feedback from various listeners, what kind of content they would look out for. Uh, Quite a few listeners liked, for example, my old NWA US title work that I did for the podcast. Well, a personal project uh, I had in mind that I really wanted to do is go back and watch 
all of the Starcades starting in 1983 through NWA and work all the way to Starcade 1997. So that's an example of the personal project I have. What is a personal project you have, Kay, that you would like to bring to the $5 tier? Just as an example. Uh, so um, I, have, I have done this episode on my own podcast covering JD Star, but I also had mentioned that there was a period of time there between 2001 and 2002 is not very well documented. Um, and I was lucky enough, again, the same person we had stumbled upon has copies of events from then. So I want to re- watch the uh, the events and review them and sort of give a, a bit of a rundown of what was going on in JD Star at that time. A very personal project that I enjoy because I'm a, a sucker for the dark age of Joshi and all the information that's hard to dig up from there. Yes, and uh, obviously I can't imagine there's a lot of wrestling podcasts out there or podcasts in general that that cover these times and that's that's a a big goal of ours is to get i mean that's why we cover all japan women the way we have starting in the early 80s to the dark days of nitro you know uh very uncommon periods of wrestling that we're covering and in order to bring all this extra content and to put this uh this time aside uh we feel that we have to also work uh, if we're to take any sort of money from listeners. So we do feel this obligation, and we have a lot of stuff for the work. You can, uh, for time frame wise, you can probably look at at the very least uh, two extra episodes a month uh, from at least the uh, Joshi wrestling side, and then uh, one from me and one from K each month. Or the personal project side at the five dollar tier, as well as anything else we'd uh, like to cover. So um, that's up to it's. It feels like a uh, four episodes a month, or uh, in total, you are a member of the five dollar tier. And if you are uh, uh, naturally anything that you sign up for the five dollar tier, you also have access to the dollar fifty tier. So I don't think it's a huge uh, financial commitment at all. And if you can't, uh, even if you don't feel like you can afford it, there is still the free episodes going up on a delay on Kay's Big Egg Joshi podcast. So again, that's Red Leaf Retrocast, Patreon, uh, bonus content, and we do have uh, a Discord that's long-winded, very good community. Um, if you join the Discord, uh, hit me up on Twitter at BowlingJD for a link. Uh, You can be invited, and a lot of the people in there also have access to our drive that we are creating for a lot of these videos. So uh, that's the benefit to joining the nice little Discord community, and you can just be a part of the fun. So, yes. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, That also, if you jump into that drive, into the Discord, uh, I highly recommend watching some of this stuff as we talk about it, as I also believe uh, viewing it, well as hearing people speak about it is very much important yes and one thing that was highly demanded is we end each wrestling episode with the wrestler rankings and i also do a short little write-up at the blog uh redly fretcher cast blog dot blogspot dot com uh starting in 2021 at the very least we will uh do a side episode for the five dollar tier just having fun and discussing the rankings uh who are the movers the significance of their position uh, and it's all based on of course of the uh promotions that we cover and who becomes wrestler of the year our matches of the year how it goes down and i think we're also going to uh do a long-winded uh uh, 2020 wrestler of the year episode includes the top matches of the year uh singles tags and whatnot, so we're getting at least, it sounds like, three episodes out of that. So there's a lot of content coming to the $5 tier. There's no no doubt about that. So a lot of audio coming your way. I mean, we already, we already talk about this <laughs> on our own, okay? So why not uh, give it out to the, a lot of the listeners that want more of it? Correct, correct. So, enough of that. I'm going to uh, play a fun little uh, Manami Toyota drop here. That's a a nice little thing to do here. And we can get into our very first free Joshi episode covering 
the 2010s dark times are upon us. Here we go. All right. I figured you'd like that Manami Toyota thing for you, Kay. How'd you know she's one of my favorites? There we go. So, the way we're starting this, uh, before we go into the 2010s, there was a certain promotion uh, that kind of was, I don't want to call it a benchmark, but it was very important to the scene as a whole in Japan called Neo. And uh, Kay, feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, Neo was shortly about to close in 2010. We're starting basically with, we are more or less describing as the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. 2010 was a very important year in Joshi uh, as a number of promotions had recently closed, were about to close, and as we find out, a lot were about to open heading into the 2010s. So this show we're covering is called uh, uh, Neo Joshi Puro Carnival 2009 that took place on December 31st, 2009. So and to give a little... Uh, oh. To give a little background over the number of promotions, uh, we have something written down from a historical perspective, and to give you, the listener, an idea of what was going on in the scene, maybe some of the wrestlers to pay attention to, because a lot of this we are also watching for the first time, because it just hasn't been covered, but from what we've read and researched, a lot has come up and how important this is. Do you have anything to add to that, Kay? Uh, yes, because you, so you have mentioned sort of promotion starting and, and closing, and um, a lot of the significance of Neo, especially at this point, is uh, it is sort of one of the two only successful Joshi promotions at this time. By successful, I mean they're making money. They're not making a lot of money, but they're not the red. They're not going under like a lot of the ones around them still are. Um, so, for a little more context, the promotion that Nana Takahashi had started in 2006 closed in this the year we're covering at this point, 2009. It closes in April of that year. It lasts three years and had no success. Um, AJW is also closed at this point at 2005. Um, Gaia is also closed. Stuff like this. It's The, the scene as a whole was very much uh, dark and... There was not a whole lot of go on, a whole lot of good going on. Wrestlers couldn't make money off of wrestling, so they would wrestle, but they would also have to have day jobs. Um, most notably, Kana or Asuka today would talk about how she was a freelance writer for many gaming magazines. This was kind of how she made money because wrestling made very little money. And I would like to add a bunch of these promotions uh, that uh, closed in the kind of the state of them. Uh, JD Star closed in 2007. Uh, you mentioned the moderate success of Neo here, which we're covering on this episode. All Japan Women is indeed dead. JWP, another promotion. It uh, almost closed for a second time, but it's still hanging on, mostly on that old AJW success, if you can quote-unquote that. Uh, it does eventually become uh, what is now known as Pure J. Uh, Gaia, that's Chigus and Agayo's promotion, despite... Uh, from the research shows it was actually profitable and successful but Chico Sinagayo uh, noticed that the <laughs> the trends were heading downward so she it wasn't closed in 2005 but it might as well have been it officially closed in 2007 Oz Academy which is going to be a promotion you're going to hear a lot of uh, going through these years they're still doing its own thing that is a promotion run by Mayumi Ozaki a Joshi Legend K, your favorite wrestler, I hear. Uh -huh. No, nah. good <laughs> joke there. Uh, at this point in time, they don't have their Garo TV deal, but they are airing shows on there, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, yes, Samurai TV as well. Um, also, a fun note about Oz Academy is it became officially a promotion in the earlier 2000s as it was sort of just a faction from JWP that right. Mayumi Ozaki had formed. And she splintered it off and started her own Purdue shows, which eventually became a um, promotion. They wouldn't get, even get a title belt until way later. Yes, uh, genius maneuvers there from Mayo Miyazaki. You'll be hearing about her genius very often. <laughs> Sendai, a promotion owned and run by Mako Satomura. It simply exists at this point in time. If you uh, compare it to today in the year 2020, 
in 2021. Nothing has changed. It just, no, it's just—it's very steady, bottom, uh, not a lot of buzz, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then another promotion you're going to hear a lot of on this podcast, I imagine, or at least somewhat on uh, as we go through the years, Pro Wrestling Wave. It started in 2007, so you can kind of put years together here with closing 2006-7 and some opening 2006-7. Pro Wrestling Wave is one of those that opened. They're doing all right, but they haven't hit their gaining traction period, and we'll get into that in a second with going forward. These are the promotions heading down and new ones cropping up. Wave starts their Catch the Wave tournament in 2012. That is their traction period. Oz and Sendai, they maintain uh, their own piece of order. They're doing their own thing. Stardom, probably a promotion most of our listeners are familiar with, started in 2011. And we're going to get into a certain wrestler here on this show on how she uh, and a number of of other wrestlers on this uh, show we're covering here in Neo, kind of impacted and their importance to the scene. And naturally, and last, there's Ice Ribbon. If you're a listener of the Redley Fretcher cast, we cover Ice Ribbon quite a lot and have been for quite some time. They start to gain traction also in 2012, coinciding with Wave, but this is after Emi Sakura leaves the promotion in, you guessed it, 2010. So a lot of important scene changing uh, that you would see uh, the fallout much later in, in, uh, as time would go on. These are all very important things in the Joshi wrestling scene. And uh, if you want a little just kind of hindsight uh, in how women's wrestling is viewed as a whole since basically the year 2000 up until this point, there really isn't a lot of it to speak about. Luckily, Kay, you're going to cover JD Star, and that will hopefully uh, provide some uh, guidance and perspective of the time there. But in Western wrestling, women's wrestling is kind of non-existent at this point. I mean, the biggest thing that's happening uh, over in the West is Trish Stratus and Lita have a, ma- ma- I don't want to say mediocre a main event on Raw, but that because of the way. Uh, women were portrayed in the West and the more or less death <laughs> of the Joshi scene in the East. Uh, women's wrestling is not viewed upon as this, uh, what it used to be in the 80s and 90s, as this incredibly um, ahead of its time wrestling. Uh, I want to offer just one small correction on Wave. Uh, Catch the Wave started in 2009, but its first popular, the first tournament that sort of got the momentum for them that sort of made that their big annual thing that would get them all the eyeballs was in 2012. Okay. All right. That makes more sense then. As for the scene as a whole, you are, um, it's funny how the parallels between the, the West and the East scenes were. So over in here in the States, women, women's wrestlers were highly sexualized. Uh, that was kind of their existence. They were just there to be, uh, tits and ass on a screen mm-hmm. and not really there for the wrestling abilities. Over in the Joshi scene, it was very much almost similar, except the wrestlers more often not could wrestle and could put on good matches. Uh, but if you just look up anything on Hikaru Shida or Sukasa or Kana or Mio or Io, you find a lot of very risque photo shoots that they did. That was another way that these people made money because wrestling wasn't paying, so they had to use sex appeal to make any any sort of sort of money. Right. Um, Star also had a very notable example of one wrestler that went into the porn industry to make money and ended up getting blacklisted. So there was still like lines that weren't allowed to be crossed. But there was a whole lot of um a whole lot of not nice, not good things going on at the scene. I, I would say that the Joshi scene compared to the men's scene at this point was very much still in the doldrums. Like I think it was a lot harder for these people to to sort of make any success or any money as opposed to the men's scene, which at least had one or two, correct me if I'm wrong, one or two, or at least semi-successful promotions that were making money for people. Yeah, and and the men's scene wasn't that... I mean, it was better to an extent, but it wasn't that great. New Japan uh, in 2010 was just starting to uh, head into the positive direction. Dragon Gate was probably the most successful of the time, in my opinion. Uh, Noah, unfortunately, had the death of their owner and founder, Mitsurao Masawa, so Noah was on a, a huge downturn 
at this point ddt was um starting to gain a little traction but it was still one of those newer promotions getting eyeballs on it uh all japan just hasn't been the same since the split with noah uh you get the idea so japan wrestling in this time not just joshi was uh was going through a quite the rough period and right. there's a reason why Western wrestling uh, was going through their own period with only basically one company um, running the show with uh, a couple others, uh, namely TNA and ROH, just trying to gain their own sort of traction in their own way. And uh, let's face it, in 2009, being less than successful <laughs> in, right. in, in well, the ways they had had in mind. Very scary comparison. Um, I again, I don't know how the men's were, but uh, Neo, this promotion right here, we're about to talk about, uh, was one of the most successful ones, and they couldn't even pay everybody. When they did multi-person matches, they would hire sort of indie comedy geek wrestlers, male wrestlers, because it was cheaper than hiring a bunch of other Joshi wrestlers. Oh, uh, there's a good match that will describe that <laughs> that sort of tactic. Yeah, so that's why sort of why why I make mention of that. It's even the most successful wrestlers at this point in time weren't exactly making bank. Um, I think unless you were like a Manami Toyota who was still wrestling at this point, uh, you were not making any money. You could barely even afford to pay for your gear, which we also would see in some of the wrestling gears later on. Um, it's very not good. A lot of a lot of direness, as we sort of joke about with Stardom's kind of current stuff where people would talk about how it's dire. Uh, current stuff is nowhere near as bad as this this is awful times for most of the wrestlers again grab your shoots were kind of how a lot of them made money if they didn't want to have a second job or if they couldn't even with a second job afford to do wrestling i mean for christ's sake there was a whole show where they had wrestlers wrestling porn actresses and that was meant to make a lot of money and it didn't make any money actually uh, and there's a lot of sort of there's so, a lot of these what, tactics that do. still bleed into the scene today uh, whether you see that as a pure negative, uh, it is still a way to make extra money. Nonetheless, you still see a lot of uh, photo books uh, among a lot of the wrestlers out there and promotions. Uh, you see part-time idol work, part-time model modeling work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it all bleeds. It, it it all runs together. But let's not waste any more time here, Kay, on this bonus content, free Patreon episode. Joint between the Big Egg Joshi Podcast and Red Leaf Retrocast. The name of the event we're covering today, once again, is Neo Joshi Pri uh, Puro Carnival 2009, which took place on the 31st of December 2009, the very last day of the year. The promotion is, of course, Neo Women's Pro Wrestling. Uh, the location is at Corken Hall in Tokyo, Japan, and it got a massive attendance surprisingly enough, of 976 people according to Cage Match. It didn't broadcast, however, until the 27th of January 2010 on Samurai TV. So there's a little nice little fact there. We begin our show with a singles match of Aya Yuki defeating Natsumi Kawano in six minutes. Okay, what'd you think? Uh, it was very much a classic uh, rookie beatdown sort of match. Um, I believe this is one of the one rookies. Um, I believe it was um, uh, I. It was uh, Natsumi, right? Natsumi, Natsumi was the Kawano, rookie. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She was the rookie here. Um, she was one of a few rookies that would get signed to Neo. One of Neo's bigger problems that, that they never really remedied was getting rookies to stay getting new wrestlers to just even stay in general. Um, this is a perfect example of this. Uh, we found out this person doesn't even have a cage match. She would probably last maybe a year tops at that point. Yes, yeah, a very it's very much problem. a problem in Neo. And for those that don't don't uh, don't know, who ran Neo? Who founded it and who runs it? Yoko Inoue ran Neo. Okay. And what is Nanae Takahashi's position with Neo? So Nanai, at this point, her promotion, Sun, or Chick Fight Sun, or whatever name she was going by at the time with it, uh, it had just closed. So she was more freelance. So she would come in and sort of do stuff with Neo as well as Wave and other things. But she was pretty much just a, a featured act. Um, she had sort of her little faction within 
uh, Neo called Passion Red. It was mm-hmm. her, Natsuki Tayo, Kana, and um, Passion Ray, or was just Ray at the time, but she would go by Passion Ray under the, that umbrella. And that was sort of what she did in Neo, really. And the reason why I ask and bring that up is because she has a very prominent role in the years to come, including this very show. Yes, big and things happen at the end of the show. If you hear me refer to her as Nene, it is uh, kind of just a uh, a joke that we all kind of have with uh, one Takahashi here. So yes, Aya Yuki defeats Natsumi Kawano in a rookie beating. The match that followed is a tag team match. Asami Kawasaki and Fuka, get into her in a second, they defeat the tag team of two very young up-and-comers, that would provide, well, drawing power for much of the scene in years going forward. Hikaru Shida, one who now is the current AEW Women's Champion in North America in a major wrestling promotion, and Tsukasa Fujimoto, the, well, booker and basically the owner of Ice Ribbon. Yes, this is also a very interesting time in both careers, as this is before Tsukasa gets trained by Manami, and this is even before she goes by Venus Shoot. She does the Venus Shoot, but she doesn't even name it yet. She's still, I think, like a year into her career, year and, and a half. What is the Venus Shoot for those that don't know? Is a top rope like insiguri kick. She just she hops up onto the top rope from a running. She runs to the turnbuckle, hops up on the top turnbuckle, and runs off into a kick to the top of the head. Yeah, we see it in this match too. Uh, for those that watch a lot of Dragon Gate, uh, that is Masaki Mochizuki's big move as well. So for there's some crossover there. The match goes eight minutes, and according to her cage match profile, Asami Kawasaki debuted in 2003 in JD Star. And for those that are wondering, Fuka, I think I've heard that before. Kay, who is Fuka? Fuka was also trained and debuted in JD Star, but I think more people nowadays know her for being involved in Stardom's early days, sort of as the trainer, ring announcer, and general manager over there before she left in about 2018. There you go. Sheeta gets pinned after this match off a sort of power slam from Fuka. Uh, there are a lot of tiger faint kicks in this uh, in this match. As um, I K, correct me if I'm wrong, but from my perspective, when you come from JD Star, you primarily use a lot of kicks in your offense. Uh, a handful of them did. Um, sure Yumioka seemed like it to me. Well, these two especially, but Yumioka came from JD Star, and she doesn't. Use, she's a big boot. She doesn't really have a lot of side that kicks. Sounds or like a kick to me. <laughs> sounds like a boot to me um but boot it's... kick front foot kick <laughs> so jaguar yakota did a lot of the training and for the the earlier rookies you can sort of see some of that but she was very hands-off in fuka and a lot of them so they kind of maybe had some tangential training from her uh, mm. but her involvement in jd star was very uh she was there for a bit then bounced in 2001 so it was not a it's really unclear who specifically taught her. I mean, Cage Match has one thing on there. Um, I've seen it counted other places who's trained her. But um, not the kicks weren't entirely a thing. JD Star was weird because like the top card was actually pretty good. Like the top wrestlers, the big ones were pretty good. Uh, but everything else was just a bunch of actresses that couldn't wrestle, that were just trained to wrestle. It was very messy. Yes, and speaking of actresses... Uh, Tsukasa and Shida. <laughs> yes, both of them involved in the Muscle Venus acting portion, like the show, not the idol group that spawned from it. Um, that would only be Miyako Matsumoto who was involved in that. Um, but these two sort of debuted around the same time. They both came through Ice Ribbon under Emmy doing wrestling training for the show that they were going to appear on being called Muscle Venus. Yes, and we'll get into more of Emmy Sakura later. Uh, since she is on this card. Tsukasa Fujimoto was easily the best wrestler in this match, I feel, and the most exciting. I think that, I think that shows... Uh, I think she's also one of the older ones in this match. I forget how old Fuka is at this point. Yeah, I don't but have she... that information on hand, but Shida, I believe, was 18 at this point in time. 
Yeah, she was very young, comparatively. 20 tops, and Tsukasa Fujimoto, I believe, is 26. Somewhere around there, especially because she's, I think, about 38 now, about to turn 39. So she Maybe was a bit on the older... She was a bit on the older age bracket there, um, especially for her experience. But you can see from very early going that she was incredibly talented and picked up on things very quickly. Um, I would go and call her a prodigy like I do, like Io and Suzu. Um, but she wasn't uh, this way forever. She would have p- sort of periods where she didn't catch on to everything. Sort of see some of that earlier in her rookie days. You can kind of see flashes of that in this match where she goes for a tiger faint kick and kind of gets caught in the ropes a little bit, uh, maybe in the not not the right position all the time. Uh, but compared to Hikaru Shida in this match, and don't get me wrong, I love me some Hikaru Shida, maybe more than I, I should over the years, but she was unbelievably green and horrible in this match. You could... If you told me she is in her first wrestling match ever, I would believe you right here. Yeah, she she started off very rough. Um, she would obviously get very much better, um, but it would take her a few years to get to that point. That that shows uh, your first couple years in the industry is not uh, the direct indicator of how you will end up turning out. Um, and to give a little visual perspective here, when Sheeta would take a, oh, I don't know, a forearm to the chest, a very, very simple Joshi move, she wouldn't just do a flat back bump, right? She would kind of spin and then fall on her hip, you know, and then land on her hands and get back up awkwardly, and it just, it doesn't look right, right? And that's that's kind of the, the story of this match is watching Asami and Fuka kind of kick the two, let's call them rookies, just for the, the sake of it right now, uh, these two rookies and Fujimoto would be running around the ring, uh, clearly showing that she has more movement than anybody else in the ring. And then Sheeta just doesn't look like she belongs in there quite yet. But yes, they uh, they do lose. I did enjoy this match, uh, despite its its roughness. Uh, and then uh, if you don't have anything to add, Kay, unless you do. Uh, just that um, she looked she looked pretty lost, and I too enjoyed this more from a historical standpoint. Well, actually, old Sukas Fujimoto is always a treat for me. So, well, we move on to a three way match: the Battle of the Matsumotos, Hiroyu Matsumoto with straightened highlighted hair. That'll throw off uh, those from uh, modern times. She's taking on and defeats. Miyako Matsumoto from that same group with Shida and Fujimoto, and one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, Dump Matsumoto. She's back, Kay. <laughs> she is. She was very much still kind of active at this point, though not so much these days. Uh, she was just a legend that beat people up. Think current day Aja Kong. Yes, it's that is, that is an apt role. comparison. Yeah, yeah. Dump Matsumoto for those that uh, are are listeners of this podcast. When we do the All Japan Women Classics, you will know my love and admiration for the woman. She, uh, her whole purpose is to stand there and murder. <laughs> and murder yes. she did. Miyako comes out to the song Dancing Queen, which uh, got a pop from me. It's very weird. Hiroyo comes out to CC Music Factory's Live Happy. <laughs> and then Dump comes out to her dump music. Crowd... Chants like a bunch of marks. Matsumoto. Love it. Getting everybody uh, getting everybody over with that chant. Dump kills, no cells, and Miyako is all about the ballet pose shtick. Uh, nothing Miyako does is sold by either wrestler. Uh, they do. Uh, there is a combination maneuver of Hiroyo doing a front uh, flat back drop kick. I will uh, from now on call that a front drop kick, just so to give people a visual. So Miyako... <laughs> Dump is finally down in this match, Kay, and I love this moment because it got a big pop from me and it got a big pop from the crowd. You would think when a wrestler is being held down as Hiroya was holding down Dump, Miyako will finally, like, give her a nice little elbow drop or maybe she'll go off the ropes and do a splash, you know, do some sort of offense to uh, assert their dominance. They finally accomplish something, right? Well, this is not Miyako Matsumoto's role as we will, uh, we will see, <laughs> we will be seeing a lot of her, I imagine throughout this generation of Joshi. She does some ballet poses. She runs over the body of Dump Matsumoto. She poses to the hard cam and does a pirouette spin, 
big time pose in the ropes, and then dump rises like Godzilla out of the sea. Behind her, the crowd goes, ooh, and then Dump Matsumoto, and I'm not making this up, does her own little, she doesn't spin, but she does the kind of curtsy ballet pose, kind of mocking Miyako, and the crowd goes nuts. Very funny moment. Very, very funny. There's also a moment where Dump tosses Miyako, and Miyako, on her own, decides to bump super hard against the bottom rope. Like, she didn't have to fly that far. She didn't have to do the extra stuff that she did, but uh, Miyako Matsumoto is very much about the theatrics, as we see. Oh, there's a lot of that. Hiroya Matsumoto is kind of the same size height-wise as Dump. Uh, significantly in better shape, but Dump has never been about the, uh, you know, the six-packs of abs. Um, you might want to write that fact down, Kay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the thick abs, no, she does not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh... As soon as uh, Dump Matsumoto was done ragdolling Miyako, they go to the outside, the crowd pops hard, and this just cues the murder brawl mode for Dump Matsumoto that we all know and love. No knives and shit coming out in this match, but we do get a good kendo stick uh, beat down, go through the crowd. People, She's parting the Red Sea of, of, of rabid fans, uh, and Miyako more or less kind of escapes, hiding through the crowd into the ring. Hiroyo makes short work of her, taking advantage of of dump uh, enjoying her murder spree she went on uh hits her with a big kind of over over the shoulders gut buster uh and dump is like what the fuck i didn't get in the ring in time gets her heat back beats the shit out of Hiroyo, gives uh miyako a nice little kendo stick swing to the ankle that looked like it sucked <laughs> for miyako it pretty much did. and that's the end of the match very fun four minutes 33 seconds just remember, Miyako Matsumoto wins the Cross Infinity Belt, then Cross Sixty Belt in 2010. Yeah, well, she gets a good put. She gets a good push for her amazing uh, crowd connection. Something like that. <laughs> All right, Kay, you want to take this next match? Uh, okay. So, next match is Emmy versus no. Kyoko Inoue. No, Whoa. no, it's the Comedy Battle Royal. Oh my god. No, With the Comedy. Is it not? No. Me... Well, Oh, let me, let, me, let me look at the notes real quick. The Natsuki Tayo match. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. See, I got the got amount of order in my brain. Uh, Natsuki Tayo, the ace of high speed, as she was, I, I don't think she was dubbed the ace of high speed, but the master of high speed. And, um, and Neo, uh, more synonymous with high speed, takes on Kenny Omega. Yes. Very a very young looking Kenny Omega. Young mid card Kenny Omega on a Neo show in two thousand nine. Keep that in mind where he is eleven years from this point. <laughs> this match was um all about the sort of speed of Tayo and the sort of power and speed of Omega. Uh Natsuki Tayo would get a little bit of offense in. And then Kenny would sort of shut it down with one or two moves. Very much a, a typical intergender match. Um, was very fun. Uh, the finish was what I what I liked about that is it because it was a knockout. He hits her with a a dragon suplex once, sort of staggers her back a little bit. She gets a little bit more or tries to get a little more offense in. Then he hits her with a second one and that knocks her out. And it was a ref stoppage. Keeps sort of the well the un. The it didn't un totally the knock her ace. out. It didn't totally knock no, her out. It, was a ref it, it knocked her out enough for it was a ref stoppage, which I liked because it kept the sort of star of Neo looking somewhat strong. Like he didn't pin her. She had to be knocked out to lose. And as well as it keeps Kenny Omega looking strong as he's not losing to a four foot nothing woman. Well, I mean, yes, it's the it's all about the optics in the match, right? It's an intergender match. It's six foot whatever Kenny Omega against four foot whatever Natsuki Tayo. Uh, the height differential in power is significant. Kenny Omega plays with her at first, you know, messing around, messing about. He's very he's clearly the cocky heel in this. Uh, he's the antagonist in the story, right? And Tayo finally gets the better of him by doing a lot of those lucha arm drags, high speed stuff uh, that we know that we will know from her. And Kenny Omega sells the shit out of this. As soon as she gets like a few arm drags in, gets the better of him, uh, they go, they, they go, instead of going for that, they both pop up and do a pose. 
they they both pop up and Kenny Omega sees her and immediately flies backward on his ass like what the hell no 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 get her away from me it's very good the crowd reacts really well to this and it kind of proves that you know when you when you look forward on how Omega's career went from this point you can tell why he can wrestle with so many different styles and sized wrestlers the way he can because of doing matches like this with Natsuki Tayo's no slouch. She can do her style really well, and it's all about Omega trying to get the uh, better out of his opponent and getting that person over. Now, you mentioned the finish here, which I really liked because uh, what ends up happening is it all builds up to Omega's dragon suplex, right? So he hits the first one, and he immediately goes, I finally got it. Ref count to 10, because that's what he was looking for. He didn't want to just beat her. He wanted to, uh, like, get rid of her, escape her. That's what it came across like to me. And then, as you said, Tayo gets a, a couple more things, and he hits one more Snapdragon on her. And uh, that's when he goes to count uh, to 10 again for the knockout and she's crawling to him. She's going to, and she, it looks like she's about to crawl up his, uh, legged waist to get back to her feet, but she just couldn't make it. And Omega escapes. He's very proud of the effort he put in. The crowd reacted well. And he raises Tayo's hand in, uh, kind of a congratulations. Like, Hey, you lasted longer than I thought you would. It all came across very well to me. Good job. Mid card Omega. <laughs> Yes, I, I do think it was done very well because it, it played off both of their strengths. Kenny Omega, sort of cocky healing, but he's also got a bit of speed and strength over advantage over her. But she's clearly faster, so she utilizes her speed, the arm drags, the high speed, uh, to sort of keep her advantage whenever she can. Like, see, like she, he wants to escape her because he can't pin her down because she's constantly moving. Yes. He'll hit her with a few big moves, and then when she gets back up, he has to like she's like slippery. He can't grab her. He can't get to her. It's great. It was very well done. I, is the I enjoyed this. Now, <clears throat> this is followed by the battle royal. Uh yes. So thankfully, a lot of a lot of this was cut, hard cut in a lot of ways. The match goes twenty three minutes thirty eight seconds. It's kind of in this Royal Rumble setting. Uh, set up to it. Uh, the contestants were, and I use contestants because I will not call most of this match wrestlers, nor wrestling. It is Small Antonio Noki, Tanny Mouse, who I'm, I think we'll see more of, Chone Siriu, the same guy you might see in Modern Ice Ribbon, uh, as he's more of this uh, martial arts, kung fu type dude that carries pots and pans around. I think you see him on Gato Move with Emi Sakura as well. Yes, you do. Uh, Jikio Man, or Yikio Man, however you want to pronounce it. Ron Yu Yu, you know, uh, from Oz Academy. Sekai New Umizawa. Small Giant Baba, which is quite the name. <laughs> Tiger Kid, it's a uh, parody of Tiger Mask. Toshi Yamatsu and Yuki Miyazaki. So yeah, straight comedy. And to me, most of it was bad comedy. Had a couple spots that made me chuckle, like the... Uh, live mic ring announcer during this match getting a spot and he's uh it really took me back to as he's in the match calling his own moves and everything it took me back to that one time in tna where booker t had a live microphone and he was commentating during his own beatdown in the ring <laughs> oh booker t's over here in the corner he's putting the boots to him oh booker t's hit him with an ass kick oh booker t ah <laughs> that's what this guy reminded me of and yeah, it was uh, kind of. He also called. He also called everyone else's spots while he was also in the ring. Yes, he was also trying to call the match as well. It's very, very wacky. Uh, the parody, you know, Kid Baba Inoki or uh, Tiger Baba Inoki characters were kind of fun. I don't know what Ron Yu Yu was doing in this match. She was very out of place to me. Uh, Her and Candy Mouse were just kind of there in the ring for the most of it they would do a few things but because most of this match was uh was cut down we saw very little of what they were doing and i i do thank the uh the dvd crew for that i did not need to see more of this uh and they even do a dusty finish to end this battle royal rumble situation where there's two people on the outside i believe it was small Inoki and ron yu yu I don't think it matters if I'm correct on that. 
but uh, they both hit the ground at the same time, so they do the uh, Lex Luger Bret Hart type finish. Um, not the clothesline over the top type stuff, but you get the idea. They both hit the ground at the same time, and the ref originally calls for a draw, but they aren't going to have this. So they go to a Inoki impression battle in which, you guessed it, small Antonio Inoki does indeed win this one. Okay, I did not enjoy this very much at all. <laughs> no, no, and this also is a goes to show one of the things that we'll see on uh, not every one of these shows from this time period, but we will see it more frequently than I think we see it in modern times. Uh, again, the comedy wrestling geek parody guys that are cheap to sort of throw money at to get onto these multi-person shows. Notice we only had like four Joshi wrestlers in here. Yes. I'd imagine that was a lot of money that they had to spend for how many people were in the ring as a whole. I think it was like 10 in total, something like that. So they had to pay for some people. And so it's these comedy people that are pretty cheap. They got not good. I mean, not even close to being good. All right. Eight-person tag is next. And I'm going to name all the uh, wrestlers in this one. Atsuko Emoto, Kyoko Kimura, Mima Shimoda, very important to name there, Tomoka Nakagawa take on the team of Makoto, Yukari Ishino. Okay, who is this Yukari Ishino? She looks familiar. <laughs> that would be one Kagetsu, and she is only a week away from announcing herself as Kagetsu. There you go. Very important time frame there. And then their tag team partners in this eight-man tag are the Shirai sisters, Io and Mio Shirai. Boy, that hair. Uh, the hair all around on this show. <laughs> Watching Mio and Io with two-toned hair, I, I always get weirded out by seeing it because it's so weird, especially on Io. So the match goes 15 minutes, 7 seconds, and I'll get into why... Uh, that time is important. Before the match, we get a nice little video build package of Shimoda more or less getting a team together. Uh, something involving a story, involving a cage match, and somebody retiring. Uh, and this leads to them uh, taking on Kagetsu and various teammates. Uh, it wasn't exactly clear to me. Do you have anything that can possibly fill this gap of knowledge here, Kay? So I dug a little bit, and I do believe the one retiring was Etsuko Mita. Uh, the cage match, I have no idea what that plays into it, but I do know Shimoda and Mita sort of, I believe, were a tag team. Um, and I think maybe that had something to do with some of the story. It, it was still very unclear, but at least I, we kind of figured out, because I think we were originally sort of questioning who was the one that was retiring. It was very confusing. But it, it, as a whole, the story going in was very... Uh, I, I I don't know. It didn't look good. I mean, we don't know Japanese, so we can't really. Well, even then, it still wasn't all that clear, uh, despite it all. Unfortunately, and I brought up that 15 minutes, 7 seconds, the DVD we have, unfortunately, only shows up four total minutes of this match, which is highly disappointing. Uh, we see a short flash of the Shirai sisters doing their thing, you know, drop kicks, running, running the ropes, whatnot, the way they do. Very good stuff. But it's basically Shimoda versus Makoto in two parts of two minutes a pop. We get a beginning of Shimoda. We see young Kagetsu in her Sendai Girls red onesie <laughs> that she was wearing at the time. Young Makoto in uh, looking nothing like she does these days. No, not even close. And correct me if I'm wrong, Kay, but Makoto is a former Ice Ribbon champion at this point. Yes, she is one of, I think, the first two or three Cross Infinity Champions that, that she is. So she is a former world champion at this point. All right, keep that information in mind. Kagetsu is only in her second year as a wrestler. She's barely a sophomore. So, logic would dictate the veteran, Mima Shimoda, being the focus of this match, pins the rookie, or... Someone on the, let's call them, rookie team, the young team, pins a veteran uh, to go over and get a big rub from the veteran. That's what logic would say, okay? Right. What happened instead, Kay? 
as we end the last two minutes with Mima Shimoda and Makoto. Mima Shimoda hits, I believe, her finisher and pins Makoto. And what I, I mean, first off, she no sold most of Makoto's offense. Very noticeable. Just not a whole lot of selling from Mima Shimoda. Now, I, don't get me wrong. Mima Shimoda looks like she can still go. She looks like she moves well. She is clearly a big star with the way she came out. Uh, she has the big, uh, like, pom-pom coat that she has on. The crowd re- reacts to her well. However, she's vastly deep into her career at this point. I, and I think this, is, this match right here is a good good explanation of what was killing the scene. One of the big things that was killing the scene at the time um, it was the the legends not wanting to elevate the next generation, usually trying to justify it by saying, well, I could still go and I still have marketing value. I'm still popular, which is fine. But when you're not putting over new people, you become stale. You're popular, but not everybody wants to see me with Shimoda wrestle the same couple people anymore. And so they stop watching stagnation and there's no progression. So people don't want to get invested anymore. Stuff like that that killed the scene. And Shimona didn't have to pin. If she was going to pin anybody, she should have pinned Kagetsu. She didn't have to pin the former world champion. And I think her own ego is probably what dictates her pinning the champion because she's too good to be pinning rookies. It's probably how her mindset to that was. Or Not, whomever the was booker thinking. was at this time, the owner, maybe uh, maybe there was some backstage political stuff. Uh, obviously, we're I speculating, would- but... Uh, the history of Joshi and uh, how the scene unfolds and what's going on kind of dictates, you can kind of feel what happened here. Absolutely. So one of the interesting things to bring up about the booking is it would be Kyoko in a way. However, one of the things at the time was it didn't matter what you told the person to do, like what your booking plan was, which is also killing some of the scene. Uh, they'll just say no if they're not what they, if this isn't what they want to do. Mima she want to like, just take a booking elsewhere. Right. That's why it was a lot of a lot of political strife in the backstage. At this point, like it was very doggy dog. It was I don't care about your position, I care about my position. It was very toxic backstage, a lot of toxicity backstage, a lot of political toxicity. Uh it, just, it was not a good time, as I've continuously said. And this right here is sort of a nice encapsulation of why things were going downwards consistently and not moving up. Our next match is a single, a special singles match. Emi Sakura taking on Kyoko Inoue. So the story here is Emi won the MVP award, I believe, in 2008. And this played into a big story with Kyoko just coming back to wrestling after her, her uh, steaded hiatus of the time. Emi is very much emotional. She's in tears to the point uh, about Kyoko coming back. And uh, notably, I noticed that Emmy comes out to the same music that she still uses to this day, including what I witnessed myself at AEW's Full Gear in 2019. I found that very interesting. So a very interesting sort of build into this. So Emmy Sakura, I believe this is the first time she's been acknowledged with a major award. So she's emotional at that regard. As for Kyoko Inoue, she would have a... So her hiatus wasn't like she stepped fully away from wrestling. There was a period of time where she did, but when she came back, she was very tepid. Like she'd be in matches, but she wouldn't be involved in matches. She would just be on the apron more often than not, kind of existing for the sake of the company, at least getting money because she was a big name. Mm. Okay. Um, she had a miscarriage, I believe, was what actually happened, and that affected her a lot mentally at this point in time. I mean, you could even see it in the match. She looked a little checked out. Um, Kyoko Inoue wasn't in a good spot. I don't think it was until after Neo had closed and she had some time and then formed Diana to where she was finally in a good spot. I mean, losing a child probably fucked with her pretty pretty hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and Emmy's emotional at the fact that this is probably like the, about the first time, one of the first times uh, that Inoue is even in a singles match. She had been involved in some multi-person matches, again, mostly sitting on the apron, but at this point, she had sort of come back into the ring a little bit in some of these matches. This is the first time she's had a singles match in a long time. As for the match itself, Kay, along with this match and our main event, I fucking love this. This was awesome. 
This is the best sub five minute match I can remember seeing in a long time. The match only went four minutes, 45 seconds. And if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, recap this entire match. Oh, go right ahead. Match starts with Emmy drop kick to the outside. Kyoko staggering. Emmy gets back in the ring. Suicide dro uh, suicide dive to the outside, takes out in a way. Then goes to the top for a moonsault to the floor on Kyoko. And it wasn't just kind of landing to the side. She flat stomachs her shoulder. Kyoko is down. Crazy. And if that wasn't enough, Emmy sets up one of those totally not going into its uh, 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 into business for itself. Japanese tables puts Kyoko on this table. And I am not kidding you. Emmy Sakura goes to the other turnbuckle. And she does a... No shit. Four fucking fifty off the top rope, onto Kyoko, onto the table. And this might shock you, but the table does indeed go into business for itself. No budge, no buys, just pure whiplash for Emi Sakura. Oh my god. <laughs> Look, uh, it hurt. That she bounced off Kyoko. Like she absolutely the table looked like sold, it sold so, so little, gave so little a fuck. She bounced off of Kyoko. Kyoko oh. didn't budge. So if we're uh, going to use that into the story of the match, when they finally get back into the ring, it's all business. Kyoko is not as damaged as she should have been because the table, of course, did not budge. Uh, that's when they just start trading big moves uh, involving power bombs from Kyoko, lariats from Kyoko, Emmy using her speed, and speed Emmy is awesome. Spemmy? Let's call her Spemmy. Spemmy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah they basically uh they ba it, it wasn't like totally no selling moves but it was definitely go 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 take the move get up do another take the move get up maybe sell uh, you know stagger a little bit uh pure sprint aspect was awesome emmy ducks a couple lariats wins off a cross body spear is what i'm gonna call it lays into it for a combo gets the pin amazing I love this match. It gets... So the way we're doing this, Kay, is when something, when a match like this hits with us so well, and you can join the Discord and easily ask for the Excel document that we are making uh, along this journey, we're putting star ratings on this. And they're going to be either no star, uh, one star for just a mild kind of recommend, two stars for a recommended match, and three stars for a highly recommend go out of your way and watch it rating. That's what we're doing by. So it is pure it is pure opinion based and it's not your little I think this is a five star match situation. I give this match two stars on our little rating that we're doing. I will give it three. Mm. Um, if only because of the story leading into it and how it all went. Okay. Also a sucker for this point in Emmy Sakura's career, so <laughs> Dude, Spemmy? I'm all about Spemmy. <laughs> Spemmy. <laughs> you love that name. You will now only refer to her as Spemmy in the early years. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just waiting for somebody to hit the Chaco Pro chat with that at this point. <laughs> Emmy, your back doesn't hurt. Speed up. Become Spemmy. <laughs> Come Spemmy. <laughs> Man. That takes us into our main event, K. The Neo tag titles are on the line. The defending champions, Passion Red, the team of Kana, now known as Asuka in WWE Land, and Nene, most people know her as Nai Nanai Takahashi, Takahashi the owner and, and booker of Seedling in modern era. They are taking on the team of Ayumi Kurihara, a name I'm very much going to be paying attention to going forward, and Yoshiko Tamura, whom is also retiring. This is, would be this would go on to be her last wrestling match, according to Cage Match, of course. What did you think of the match? You got anything to add? Because uh, there's a lot to go over in this match alone. Um. So this is the this is Kana as a striker, less submission. As we saw, she her kicks are great. She's barefoot, so if anyone that watched Konami early on saw that she was barefoot, this is where she got it from. Um, her and Nanai were a very, very good team, but they were very stiff. 
Akana especially was incredibly stiff with people. This would get her heat later on in her career with some people. Uh, Nanai being one of them. Um, but as for Ayumi, Ayumi was very good. Um, I've only seen one other match of hers prior to this. So this is like sort of a, a good good match for me to have watched her in. Because the last time I think I saw it was a multi-person, so she was barely in it. Um, very fast. This is a this main event was go, go, go nonstop. And that was sort of how Neo liked to represent its main events. Uh, nonstop, fast paced. Uh, high speed, if you will, was very much the name of the game there. Yes, and when we say go, 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 uh, it's a it's a common term used in Joshi wrestling, especially in the All Japan Women era, where it's all about your cardio, and it's all about hitting as many moves in uh, conjunction and combination with each other uh, to create a sense of drama and exhaustion. So the go 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 style is uh, very common in something like uh, Dragon Gate to an extent, um, Ice Ribbon in a lot of their tag matches, multi person tag tag matches, and Stardom. Uh, yes, it has evolved a little bit more into uh, not so much this absolute go 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 style that we saw in this match. Uh, they might start off generally a lot slower uh, in a more traditional sense, and then it dives into the go 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 style aspect and that uh that's how the style has evolved in this match in particular as you said k that the neo style is more associated with high speed all japan women to an extent of what we know tag matches to be right so you had mentioned ice ribbon like modern ice ribbon um i i would say the like like last five minutes sometimes sometimes even 10 of their tag matches is a is a good gauge for what this was where it's constant roll-ups constant strikes constant movement going on like people don't sell for too long you get hit with the move and you're down but you're not down for like ever you're not rolling on the ground laying there you're either picked back up or you pop back up after a bit to keep moving it's again neo was known for their high speed this is sort of a good representation of that cardio was very important at this point I, mean, I would, see I would also Kana compare and... this to modern AEW tag team wrestling because a lot of those guys learned from Lucha Libre and Dragon Gate and, uh, uh, well, Japanese wrestling in general. And the style of wrestling um, is, is it's very interesting to me to see how, because I'm watching, you know, we watch WCW and it's very slow. It's very maniacal. It's very... Uh, prodding i guess is a way to put it lots of holds not very exciting especially when wrestlers are so much more athletic uh and uh jaw dropping to an extent uh just trying to see how the body can can move and maneuver in different torques and aspects of the way they do it and uh throughout this match it's a lot of it's a lot of that it's it's a lot of Kana with her kicks, Nane with her power, Ayumi with her suplexes, uh, Yoshiko for the most part being the most uh, veteran of the group and of course retiring. She kind of, you know, took her time off to the side, uh, picked her spots well. You know, uh, could the cardio level maybe isn't to the level of the other three wrestlers, uh, but her spots were again picked very well and was able to insert herself in key moments okay i thought this match was absolutely off the chains i couldn't look away i thought everything just was awesome uh i didn't know who was gonna win this is an easy three-star high recommendation match for me i agree this is a three-star recommendation for me as well um, the finish, I wasn't a super fan of, but given the fact that it happened so long ago and I know what happens later, it doesn't bother me as much as if it happened in other times. I'd never like retiring wrestlers leaving with the belt. It just always comes off very, uh, like, why? Nobody well, got over. As we find out at the end of the DVD, there might have been good, good reason for that. <laughs> oh, oh, we find out right after this match, period. <laughs> um, the, the, want to just go right into that? We can just go right uh, into that. No, no, no. Let's let's because um, some of my favorite moments in the match. Uh, well, let's let's talk about the end of the match because, uh, or you know what, Yoshiko Tamura 
and Ayumi Kurihara do uh, out of the corner to, I believe it was uh, Kana, the out of the corner calling out Ace Crusher. And where uh, have we yes. seen that move? Okay. On Tsukasa Fujimoto, she, it was passed to her. Um, you would find out at this point that Tsukasa Fujimoto, one of her big signature moves weren't hers. I think the only moves that are hers are the Venus Shoot and the Venus Clutch. The Ace Crusher is not hers, and the Infinity, I do not believe, is hers either. There you go. Uh, yeah, there's a stiff, awkward backstage segment afterwards the match, but we'll get there. Uh, as I read ahead in my notes, uh, my bad. Um, there's a disgusting tag team maneuver between Yoshiko and Ayumi Kurihara on Kana as we end the match here. Um, Ayumi has Kana, uh, you know, uh, shins on her shoulders, so her stomach's facing the mat, and then Yoshiko Tamura gets her in kind of this reverse emerald flosion headlock situation going on. And then they proceed to spike Kana straight down. Looks like it broke her neck. It looked disgusting. <laughs> it's very stiff. There's a few hey. moments in the match where Kana is tagging Ayumi uh, in the in the neck and head with her with her kicks. Some look held back. Some just look like they got them very well. Um, <laughs> you mentioned heat earlier. Uh, you can you can only imagine. Uh, but the tag team maneuvers themselves between Kana and and uh, Nane, how they were able to just communicate with each other just naturally in the ring was very good. Uh, but after that devastating neck breaker there, <laughs> if we could even call it that. Uh, Kana more or less kind of staggers to her feet and Ayumi flies out of the corner and Kana kind of holds her feet up as she runs at her with double knees. The legs extend and it, do it does this like super meteora attack and that's how Kana is pinned. New tag team champions. Nane is less than pleased with this loss and Kana is just kind of head down, just keeping her mouth shut kind of situation. Uh, Yoshiko and Ayumi are ecstatic in the ring as new champions. Uh, there is no post-match retirement ceremony that we're familiar with with All Japan Women. Uh, if you go and listen to the Red Leaf Retrocast, obviously you know that there's a lot of retirements. The Ten Ball Salute, the uh, Streamers, the whole shebang. So perhaps Yoshiko didn't know she was retiring or she wanted to just go out on top or it was simply a retirement match in which politics backstage played more of a role to how this title change happened you can kind of make your own decision on the evidence but yes Kay, let's get straight and unless you have something else to say to the match let's get into these uh this awkward backstage segment i, uh, I uh, just just briefly earlier. on the retirement just briefly on the retirement so they did a clapping cheer thing sayonara to her um but that's it um i do believe the streamers and all that stuff i don't think was on at this point i mean who that who could have streamers at this point? It was not a not very popular enough for that to be done frequently. A stardom and ice ribbon, sort of the only two currently that even do that. I can't think of another promotion that does that for retirements. So it's not as common as I guess most most people would think it is. That's about it. Well, I mean, there was that that video uh, between the before the eight person tag with Mima Shimoda in which it was showing like some retirement with a bunch of streamers to somebody, but that could have been for something else. That was Etsuka Mita. And yeah. I, I believe aside from legends like her status, I don't think a lot of them got it. Okay. It was, it was very rare at this point. So yeah, it's not uncommon in Joshi or Japanese wrestling where you get a, uh, they, you head to the back and there's a uh, reporter interviewing the two. Uh, not uncommon in wrestling in the West either with like something like the NWA where you have, oh, I don't know, Tony Schiavone interviewing a uh, tag team that just got the shit kicked out of them in the match and now they're backstage and they're a bloody mess. Hey, how'd you feel about that match? <laughs> so here we are. It's uh, Nene and Kana. They're backstage, and, but it's not a reporter just asking them questions. It's almost like they came across them in the middle of an argument Nene is pissed they lost. 
Uh, we don't know Japanese, but we can kind of use body language and context for this because Nene is pissed. She's giving Kana the, the, the rundown, just belittling her. Kana's got her head down, just no eye contact to her. And Nene finally just fucking slaps the shit out of her. And that's when Kana's head raises and you see a... I saw just a fire in her eyes, right? And uh, yes, and there was a second slap too that busted Nene her lip a little bit. fucking slaps her again and busts her open. Mm-hmm, busted her lip. Um, Kana with a very defiant, um, I want to kill you look. Sure came across that way to me. Uh, this was definitely, like, I think nowadays people look at this, oh, that's got to be an angle. This was way, way too awkward and stiff to be an angle. And knowing the history between the two, you would know this is definitely not an angle. This, I don't know if you want to go into more, if you want to let me sort of explain the the history with these two a little bit. Well, let bit. me finish what happens backstage first, and then you can kind okay. of go into the history of those two. So yeah, Nene uh, ha- has her way. She leaves in a fury. Camera sticks on Kana. She puts her head back down, and she starts like kicking. She kicks a chair real hard. Kicks another chair. You can hear it clang across the room. She says a couple things at the camera, and she walks away. And then this like referee pops out of a room, just super awkward. Like, ah oh, man, I heard something I probably shouldn't have. Uh, but this was all in front of a camera, nonetheless. And uh, if this wasn't somehow more awkward, it cuts to Yoshiko and Ayumi backstage celebrating their win. Couldn't, not a care in the world, right? And then the DVD continues, because I was about to turn this off, and I'm glad I didn't, because the DVD continues, and it shows, like, a dark tag match or something, presumably Neo, and it's Kana and and, uh, Nane tagging, uh, with um, Natsuki Tayo uh, yep, passion against, read the team. Yeah, against a uh, another trio, and uh, they uh, there there's a spot where Nene is holding holding their opponent and kind of looks to to kick the opponent. Opponent ducks. Kind of tags Nene in the head. In a normal tag match situation, Nene would go down, sell the kick. You know the match would continue. Kind of gets like knocked out of the ring or something. What instead happens is Nene immediately throws down the person that she was holding, like, completely, pushes Kana up against the rope and, and says something along the lines of, like, what the fuck, right? And the match just totally breaks down. Uh, Natsuki Tayo, as a professional, continues the match. Kana is in the corner now sitting down. Uh, she's in the corner outside the ring. There's some match cuts. She doesn't tag in for the rest of the match. Has nothing to do with it. When the match ends, Nene goes over to Kana, kind of gives her a slap. Kana just grabs a mic, says her piece, thanks the crowd, bows to them, walks to the back. Nene just in the corner giving her the thousand yard stare of pissed offness that we've all we've all given that look to somebody in our lives. That's the look that I want to fight you. For reals, yeah, no. for realsies. No, that's, the, that's, the, that's the fight you. That's I want to kill you. I want I want to murder you uh, legally. <laughs> situation. If I could get away with it, I would do it. Uh, and yeah, uh, what is uh, what, obviously we'll go into more history with Kana as we go through the journey. History with Nene. Um, is this what it, what what does this moment mean in the uh, the the uh, the moment of history of passion red between these two. Um, take it away, Kay. So, at this point, they had been teaming for a better part of about a year or two. Um, Kana, there has to be at least one bit of backstory on Kana before we get to this. So, she did this thing called the Joshi Manifesto within her like a first year or two. Um, it was done in a magazine. Uh, you could probably find a translation from it. Uh, readily available on Google. Just look it up, the Kana Joshi Manifesto. Uh, she calls out the scene for the gravier shoots. Ironically enough, she does them herself later. Um, and the wrestling style, not being stiff and realistic enough, and she just runs down the entire scene. That got her a bit of heat. However, that engraced her with people like Nanai, who also had that similar mindset. This would get them to be a team, stuff like that. Um, but then... They would stiff each other in matches. I don't know the exact breakdown of why they started hating each other in the first place. 
But we see stuff like this where they're stiffing each other. They're not getting along. They hate each other. Um, I think given the fact that there's a, a supposed second manifesto that comes out not too long after this, calling out Nanai and her sort of legend friends, as well as like the rest of the scene, again, for not putting people over, not doing the job, stuff like that. I'm just running them down for that. I want to say that she had probably at least mentioned stuff like that backstage, which is probably what led to Nanai hating her. But these two, uh, at present, as far as I'm aware, Kana probably is over it. She's over it. She's making tons of money. She probably doesn't even think about Nanai. But I'm pretty sure if you ask Nanai, Nanai probably still wants to kill her. Nanai holds on to grudges. Um, sure sounds no like it with Nanai, yeah. It. There's no part of this that should come off like a work. Um, they're hitting each other. They hate each other. Um, it's, I think, more prominent when you see the fact that if it was an angle, Kana would probably have said something back to her on that dark match. Instead, she just thanks the crowd and bows and leaves. Yes, nothing, it's, it's, nothing about it comes across as a work. And the way, uh, the, the fact that they would never team again, never step in the same ring with each other again. Oh, no, no, no. And this also gives off to both Io Shirai as well. Um, EO would leave for WWE for not WWE, for stardom. Uh, Nanai was very much involved in stardom. Kana would hate EO for doing this. So whenever that's the way I always talk about when people ever people talk about how Kana was in stardom, there was no way to hell she would have stepped foot in the stardom ring. You couldn't pay her to. She hated Nanai. They hated each other. Uh, I'd be willing to say that if they ever were backstage together, there wouldn't. Uh, they both wouldn't be making it to the ring that night. Um, it, it was very much one of those things that the only reason we know more about it is because it got captured outside of the backstage area. Right. As you saw, there's a camera back there. We saw it happen in the ring. It bled out in front of people. That's how bad it was getting. Um, I mean, we would see that later with the, the Yoshiko and uh, Yak, Act As Kawa stuff. Like, we only know about this stuff because it bled out in front. Everybody. Right, and we'll we'll obviously get into major points of history with that. Bring more context and uh, and uh, research. We'll make our, we'll form our own opinions of there. Uh, if what you hear, if you disagree with anything we say, hey, hit us up on Twitter. We're we're more than available. We're more than willing to talk about uh, things like this. We have our opinions. You may have yours. We're we're more than w- willing to uh, to listen. I think it goes without saying that Nia is very much mellowed out in her older years. Um, at this point, she was not... I mean, she was stiff, people. We, we see the fact that she was stiffing Kana, and Kana wasn't the only person she would sort of shoot on. Um, it, it's, it was very much a thing of the scene at the time. Doggy dog, as I said. It's, it's fuck your stuff. I want to care about my stuff and only my stuff. Yes, sir. And that brings this first bonus content, Joshi History Wrestling, to a close, Kay. Ooh. Very fun, very uh very f- filled with a lot of knowledge. If you guys have enjoyed what you hear and you want to hear more, uh more episodes like this will be on the $1.50 tier Patreon Redleaf Retrocast. Uh more than easy enough to find uh on a two-week delay for free over at the Big Egg Joshi podcast. Feel free to hit up any of us on social medias. I'm on Instagram at BowlingJD, Twitter at BowlingJD. Kay, you're at, uh, well, you got a complicated Twitter. Please uh, spell it out for everybody. <laughs> is, uh, is K, capital K, underscore, capital Z, the number three, lowercase r, number zero. Um, no, no, it's, it's K underscore T O underscore Z three R O. Just, just look up Blue Kano, Blue Kano. Just go Blue Kano. Blue Kano is, is very much, uh, I mean, I tag you all the time in things. Uh, so maybe if you go to Bl- Bowling JD, easy enough to find. And again, if you want some of our personal projects and want to support the podcast even more, uh, this, the, all of this is coming out of our own pocket, uh, to, to get a hold of these DVDs. Uh, we're doing our own research. Uh, there, there just isn't a lot of information about a lot of these things. It requires a, a lot of work to put these in. And uh, if you want to help support this historical documentation for it all, head on over to Patreon, Redleaf Retrocast. Join that $1.50 tier. Personal projects, among other things, will be on the $5 tier. Help us out. Uh, and we, of course, thank you and hope you enjoyed. Okay, do you have any last parting words? 
uh, I hope everybody enjoys this journey as much as I think we'll enjoy this, full of knowledge and figuring, find, figuring and finding things out. Yeah. We'll see you next time. See ya.